Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Engineering for Change webinar series. We are going to be speaking with uh, Nathan Johnson today on the topic of village energy and a systems-based approach to understanding and addressing rural energy needs. Uh, my name is Yana Aranda. I am here on behalf of the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. And I will be your moderator for today's webinar. I'd like to welcome all of you. So um, just a little bit of information for you. Um, you may have noticed that the webinar is presented by Engineering for Change, um, as I mentioned. And what you'll see here is a little bit of information about some of our webinar coordinators, including Alex Torres from IEEE, myself from ASME, and Steve Welch from IEEE. Now, if you're not familiar with Engineering for Change and how we fit into this picture, I just wanted to give you a little bit of introduction. Uh, Engineering for Change represents a coalition of organizations, including the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, um, IEEE, the Institute of Electronics and Electrical Engineers, and Engineers Without Borders USA. Uh, we are a platform of, of over 9,000 engineers, technologists, NGOs, social scientists who are all collaborating to make a difference by contributing to solving water, energy, health, agriculture, and sanitation challenges confronting local communities worldwide. Um, if you are interested in checking out our digital platform, you can access a growing catalog of implemented solutions and related information from the organizations I mentioned. In addition to that, other organizations such as MIT, Practical Action, and many others having a presence on the ground and doing this fantastic work. Our solutions library is chock full of solutions to various types of challenges. So we invite you to join us and learn about the latest developments and success stories in humanitarian engineering and global development. Uh, the website is listed here, engineeringforchange.org, and we invite you all to come on board and check it out. So today we are actually uh, uh, here for the E4C webinar series as part of our Learning Lab initiative. It is a free and publicly available series, and we're focusing on sharing best practices and lessons learned about solutions employing technology to solve global humanitarian and development challenges. Now, I would like to emphasize that we are migrating the webinar series from IEEE's Humanitarian Technology Webinar Series, for those of you who are familiar with it. And it's going to be happening in the next few weeks. So I would like to please excuse our appearance during this migration process. Uh, some information is still being updated. But uh, information on upcoming webinars and all previous webinars will be available on the new website as, as we do update it. If you're interested in the next webinar, our next webinar will be on April 25th. 2012. Um, it will be presented by Emily Brocher from Refresh Intercultural Communications. And the topic of her webinar will be on focusing on cross-cultural communications. So she will be speaking about navigating cross-cultural differences on international development projects. Uh, we will be providing you with registration information uh, soon. So please, again, do excuse our appearance. So for today's webinar, I would like to first and foremost request uh, that right now you enter your name and location in the Q&A window on the left side of your screen. You will see the chat there. Um, also, please know that we like you to type any questions you have during the webinar into that same Q&A window. Uh, the presenter will answer all questions at the end of his presentation. Um, in addition to this, uh, please note that we do award PDH certificates following the completion of this webinar to request your certificate of completion uh, showing one professional development hour for the session. Please provide your full name and date uh, you completed this webinar to the email address that is listed here, eab.cuadmin at IEEE.org. We'd really appreciate that. So moving on, um, I would like to introduce today's presenter. His name is Nathan Johnson. And Nathan's expertise is in integrated energy systems analysis. Through his research, Nathan explains complex energy system dynamics using the technical, human, environmental factors that drive energy flow in society. 
This has included field research, lab research, and computational modeling. He has seven years of experience working in corporate, academic, and non-governmental organizations, including two years of research and development in eight developing countries. Nathan is currently completing his PhD in mechanical engineering at Iowa State University and has begun a postdoc with Homo Energy as an ASEE slash NSF Small Business Postdoctoral Research Diversity Fellow. He has a Bachelor of Science and Master of Science in Mechanical Engineering and a Master of Science in International Development, all from Iowa State University. And uh, just before Nathan starts, I would like to let you all know that we did tweak his presentation a little bit to fit our template. So if things are looking a little off in terms of size, we apologize. But I'm sure Nathan will uh, wow you all with some of his research, and uh, you won't even notice a thing. So with that, I would like to invite Nathan to go ahead and get started. Hello, Yana. Thank you for uh, introducing me, and also uh, for having me a guest on uh, this uh, webinar series. And also, thanks for uh, everyone in the main room to, uh, to come out and uh, see the presentation. And uh, as uh, Yana was mentioning, feel free to uh, put a little bit about your uh, questions in the, uh, the, the, uh, the chat window. And then uh, I can address those at the end. And so I guess kind of leaping in today is I am talking about uh, village energy. And that is a systems-based approach to understanding and addressing rural energy needs. And this presentation is different in the sense that it doesn't propose a single solution. What it actually seeks to do is develop the tools and the understanding to design sustainable rural energy solutions. And so what I'm going to present to you today is more so a, a methodology, some data, and a way of thinking for how we can look at uh, village energy. And in this presentation, I'm going to be giving you a, a, a bit of a three-part introduction to this topic. First of all is, what is village energy? How do we quantify it? And then I'm going to look specifically into heat and power. So we'll look into how do we compare and analyze heat systems. And then how do we compare and analyze power systems, focusing on the initial stages of the engineering design process. And what we're familiar with, or maybe we aren't as uh, familiar uh, as with it as we, as we perhaps think we are, but about energy poverty. And really, some of the big numbers just to throw out at you is that 1.4 billion people in the world don't have access to electricity, and 2.7 billion people use solid fuels for cooking and heating. And this has significant uh, health and environmental uh, effects. And I have uh, pictures on there that I've taken uh, throughout my uh, travels uh, on the far left, South Africa, uh, lower middle is Mali, uh, upper right is Vietnam, and uh, lower right is in China. And these are all examples of what energy poverty looks like in reality. And how do we get past that? And what's also even perhaps more dangerous or another issue that we're confronting is not just what currently is uh, the, those effects of poverty, but what happens when those local resources run out. And I'm speaking specifically to wood. In rural areas of Africa, simply wood doesn't grow on trees. It doesn't follow that, uh, that saying like that, we, uh, that we'd like to follow. And what we see there is that with the billion people in Africa, about 60% of them are rural, and not necessarily that we would expect that wood is going to satisfy all of the needs for all the time. And so I'd just like to throw that out at you. Another thing to consider as we're trying to put forth these uh, village energy systems-based approach is that there are many technologies that have been attempted. And nearly as many technologies that have been attempted, there are just as many failures out there. 90% of really cook stove programs up to 1980 failed within the first year. That's 90%. And a recent statistic about water projects is that over 30% failed prematurely in the last 20 years. And so there's lots of examples of failure out there. We have a little bit of quantitative knowledge of that. But the mechanisms or the reasons why they fail are a little bit harder to understand. And this is a solar water, hot water heater on the left in Mali. And that's a uh, biomass gasification unit in uh, China right there on the right. Now, in my opinion, these technologies are failing partly due to the technical uh, issues that surround that are inherent to the equipment, but then also how the technical design 
caters to the dynamic human and natural systems inherent in every local situation. These systems are not robust enough to meet the challenges of the harsh environment that we are putting them through. And so to show you, what I'm putting forward is that these are failing due to a lack of systems understanding. And really what I believe is that there's this intersection of human, environmental, and technical systems that are involved in the design process. And we're really losing a lot of the appreciation for how the, the human system affects the technical, how uh, end user behavior, uh, culture, policy, economics, and then on the environment, uh, resources, climate, affect those technical systems, which would be the thermal, mechanical, and electrical. And we can do that with uh, some proficiency here within our own culture. But now if we go to Africa, for instance, uh, different culture, different environment, we're far removed from the scenario. We haven't grown up there. We don't know what exists, what doesn't exist, what is feasible, what is not feasible. And designing solutions for the context that are so far removed from what you are innately uh, I guess experienced to do, really requires a different type of looking at a problem. We can't follow the standard engineering design process. Like I just mentioned, that's failed, and it's failed repeatedly. So what we're really looking to do is develop this systems understanding. And what's interesting with this is there's simply, where do we start from? There is nearly uh, no data out there on how much energy is used in the village. What factors define uh, why that energy is used? Uh, what area should we focus on? And this quote is an excellent example that it, it relates to energy access, but even more uh, broader speaking, that relates to anything in regards to energy, uh, what it's being used for, how it's being used, et cetera. And an example of this is I'm going to show you this graphic, which I collected from 24 studies in uh, rural sub-Saharan Africa. Is This is the annual wood consumption per capita. Uh, for rural villages, and it's displayed for 11 countries. And as you can see there, these numbers are all over the place. Now, sure, there's some local differences that you would expect between countries, but for instance, in Mali, some of the studies that are completed within five kilometers of each other vary by a factor of three or four. And on the entire breadth of this diagram, these studies vary by a factor of 13, or sorry, vary by a factor of 15. And I don't know any uh, engineering scenario where you can walk up to them and say, yeah, this is the cost, but it could vary by a factor of 15. Or it could vary in magnitude by you know, a factor of 10. That is not what we need to do. And that's one of the reasons why we're failing. And this is very basic data, but we still don't have an appreciation or an understanding for what is going on. And this is only how much wood is being consumed. This doesn't have to do with the adoption rate of technologies, how they're being used, the efficiency, anything like that. And so if we can't get this basic knowledge right, I pose a question. How well can we answer the questions that are really fundamental to the design process? And those I pose here in three questions. The first one uh, is pretty simple. What energy is going in and out, drawing a system boundary? The second, what factors actually explain uh, supply and use? So what factors drive energy supply and use? And then I'm going to use those factors to compare which energy options are sustainable. How can we make these sustainable? And I'll first do that, talk about the village, and I'll go through an example with heat, and I'll go through an example with power. So to give you a little bit more background in Mali, the study area which I focused on my dissertation research, the village that I worked in is Nanakanyeba. It's a village of 770 people. Uh, it's in a collection of villages, eight surrounding villages, a little bit larger. There is absolutely no access to electric grid, and no current plan to have an electric grid in the foreseeable future. So completely off-grid isolated. Uh, 35 kilometers to the market, and that is all on a dirt road. Everyone lives on subsistence level agriculture, at least in part, and there's a few local businesses uh, or, or artisans that make goods for the village. And another thing to note is that it's not just poverty in Mali, it's extreme poverty. And one of the indicators or examples that we see of that is that it, Mali has the sixth highest rate of death due to poor air and water quality. So there's an extreme, the lack of energy and the lack of health care is uh, creating uh, dire situations that affect the health of the population. And so those are some of the, the understanding that we're looking to, uh, to, to address. Another thing that would be important to note is that 
in Mali, as in uh, many places in the world, is that seasons really define activity in the village. <clears throat> as you see on the left, it's the wet season, quite luscious agriculture uh, and farming during that season. And then on the right is dry and arid, uh, and there's not really much activity that goes on during that period. So what uh, you find is that as the temperature fluctuates throughout the year, as it gets rainy uh, or, uh, or, or dry, is that the lack of energy and technology um, do not allow the individuals, the occupation or the household uh, capacities to really adapt to those harsh scenarios, those big fluctuations. And to tell you a little bit about how I conducted my study is I did this in four field visits. Uh, at first I did a planning visit in May of 2009 because since I'm looking at other studies that have been completed, there's been no similar studies in Africa and two similar yet not exactly the same studies completed, uh, one in South Africa on domestic uh, wood use and then one in uh, India on uh, village energy use. And so I needed to do a planning study to ask what types of questions even should I be asking. So it was more or less an observational visit and I'll tell you a little bit about that here shortly. And there was three field visits in each season, as we noted that seasons have a strong influence on uh, energy and how it's used. So during the planning study, um, for sure there is uh, getting to know the community, and you've heard lots of presentations on that, and so I'm not going to address that. We uh, went through that process, but what I'd like to tell you a little bit more is how the, the additions to that process, the additions to community engagement that are influential to the types of projects that I'm discussing. The first of which is to understand what energy is used and where it comes from is just follow a piece of wood, follow a piece of uh, charcoal, follow kerosene from the market to the household, see how it's used, measure when it's used, how it's used. And so this is just an illustration of doing that uh, from the forest, uh, carrying it on head in uh, uh, large loads of up to uh, 25 kilograms, storing it during uh, part of the season when you're farming so you can use it during the part of uh, uh, so you can actually use it when you're farming, so you don't have to go collect wood. And then there's uh, the uses on the bottom, such as uh, baking, uh, cooking, or uh, blacksmith, as you see on the far right. And so doing uh, every single piece of energy in the village, tracking it all the way through, every single source, I should say. Now from this, there's uh, another part of this that I'd like to tell you, is since domestic energy use traditionally constitutes the vast majority of rural energy use uh, in developing countries is we need to take a bit closer look about what happens inside the house. And so that's why I uh, conducted participant observations. And this really is, in all senses of the term, uh, shadowing individuals in the house uh, for a full day period, tracking uh, what they do, uh, how much, uh, what types of energy they use, what types of implements they use. And so then we can begin to shape the questions and the tests to measure that energy use. And I went through, um, throughout the village, sizes, uh, families range from 2 to 45, chose some few families based on family size, uh, was with a family the entire day, and really, like I was mentioning, it's just scoping the future tests. And if you'd like a bit more information on this, as I'm going through, you'll find out uh, pretty soon that I have um, uh, little notes up above uh, parts of the uh, parts of the text that illustrate uh, journal articles and other presentations, and I'll be happy to talk about these a little bit more in detail offline if you'd like. So for the field studies completing each season is for the energy sources, you know, wood, charcoal, and um, petroleum fuels were kerosene, diesel, as well as gas, and then electricity in the form of uh, just direct solar PV, lead acid batteries, and disposal batteries. And with the data collection, doing one surveys to get to construct this narrative, the contextual information about energy use, and then also doing the measurements and observations to get the quantitative side. Because it's not just the quantitative information that is, I guess, sufficient to construct the engineering design, uh, your engineering design. You also need to know uh, usage characteristics and a lot of that uh, contextual information to construct a narrative or a sequence or a flow diagram for how someone uses an object. And so the ga uh, data gathered during these, uh, the initial planning visit, then also the field study, just to show you a little bit of this in brief, is there were 60 families, uh, energy surveys for each one of them. There was 123 cooks out of the 770 people. Uh, 155 cooking tests, so measuring uh, what the mass uh, of each ingredient was going into the pot, 
uh, what was the starting wood, ending wood, ambient temperature. Uh, sometimes I conducted a minute by minute um, time activity log of activities that the individual did, even if it was not cooking at the time, it was going to gather gather wood uh, or uh, tend to children or gather uh, water because then that the fire can uh, quench or, or I guess stuff out during that time. And so alternative activities can influence the combustion process. And then you see uh, multiple other types of energy uh, so, uh, information on the following uh, part of that slide. And so if I could give you a one slide summary of energy in and out of a village, energy supply and energy use in a village, it would be this slide. And what you see here at the very top is that there is uh, 6,000 megajoules per person per year used in the village. And that's one fourth of the average per capita energy use for Africa, and one twelfth of that value for the entire world. Now, drilling into the specifics as far as the percentages of the energy sources, you have wood really high. It can, it constitutes the absolute you know vast majority of energy use, as does uh, the domestic on the use side. And then on the use side, you have artisan transport and public service. And just to give you an example about how you read this diagram, you see on the left, 94% wood, 4% petroleum, out of 100%. Now, if we're going from, let's say, uh, charcoal, and that 2% of charcoal, 46% of that 2%, so 46% of the charcoal that is used in the village goes to domestic needs. And 54% goes to artisan needs. Now, if I look on the use side, and I say that 4% of the energy in the village is used for artisan needs, um, baking, making cakes, um, uh, blacksmithing, other uses, 57% of the energy used by those artisans comes from wood, 10% from petroleum, and 33% from charcoal. And so this gives you a single one-page snapshot of the overview of energy in the village. And from here, I'd like to drill down a little bit further to discuss now that we know how much energy is used, now how do we understand and identify the factors by which you can actually uh, make some decisions upon. Another thing that's interesting to look at is the seasonal energy use. And in the November, December, and January, so looking at the far right of that graph during the, the cold and dry season, you see a large spike in domestic energy use. And as you would expect, even in the Sahel, in a fairly warm and arid region most of the year, that uh, during the uh, the cold season, it actually gets uh, quite cold. And so you'll be experiencing maybe 50s, uh, 60s easily uh, as far as temperatures in Fahrenheit. And with those temperatures, you're going to need some wood heating. And uh, energy use spikes quite dramatically, actually. It goes up by a factor 2.5. So energy use from the middle of winter to the middle of summer, uh, the middle of winter is actually 250% higher than the summer due to space heating. And if you were to come during one time of the year, you would completely miss that part of the analysis. And uh, that uh, space heating constitutes, I believe, about 18% about energy use in the village. And so that's a significant portion of the, uh, the wood use itself. You see a few peaks there. Uh, generally, that's just because of uh, seasonal changes. 10% of the people migrate out of the village, which also has the added interest in if people are going to move out of the village for eight months of the year, then the solutions that you would have to consider might need to be portable. Or you need to design one for their home and one for the, the hamlet of which they actually go to farm. And getting a little bit further into this is some more overview information. Uh, average wood consumption is 375 uh, kilograms per person per year. And that's in the lower quartile of all those studies that I uh, referenced in a previous slide, uh, those 24 studies on that graphic with the dots. Uh, for wood collection, uh, for women, each woman uh, spends about 250 hours a year collecting wood, children about 40 hours. What's also interesting and uh, is that that third point on there is that every household, every single household uses multiple energy sources to meet their needs. So just providing with them with electricity, if uh, the, the families need to pay for it, it's not going to be used to meet all of their needs. You're not going to use electricity for cooking, for instance. You might use it for some basic lighting, some, uh, some personal electronics, uh, maybe even TVs like they do in Vietnam. Uh, but you're not going to be using it for everything. So the energy source matches the energy and use. 
uh, and people are very uh, effective and smart at uh, doing that. And you'd find anywhere between three and five sources of energy in the home. And so for us in a, in a Western culture, you might be able to expect maybe electricity and natural gas to provide all your needs. Well, it's actually much more diverse. There's a more portfolio, and we call that uh, fuel stacking right there. And there's no evidence of the energy ladder, which means that you move from wood to charcoal to kerosene to electricity. That just isn't existing in uh, this village. And generally, the same thing can be uh, said to in rural villages. Another surprising thing is that uh, disposable batteries constitute 65% of uh, energy expenditure. And the village of 770 people, each year, 21,000 batteries are used. AA batteries, AAA batteries, C batteries for flashlights and personal electronics. And those are simply discarded along the side of the road. Now, those are zinc carbon batteries, so they're not as high performance as we would expect uh, out of the batteries that we use here uh, in uh, developed countries. But they, that constitutes a very large uh, environmental hazard. And also, if you just have children playing with the batteries, that's an important characteristic. And you wouldn't know that without asking those questions. So if we're looking at village energy solutions, it's not, I, can, I can't stress this more than enough, there's no one solution. There's no silver bullet. There's no universal solution that's going to solve everything. It's not just cooking stoves. You have to look at uh, how that device would be used for hot water. Or for instance, since uh, space heating uh, uses 18% of energy, uh, and all energy in the village, warmth could be an important consideration. Uh, clean water, lighting, and power for small electronics, those are all provided by electricity, which is nearly a rounding error when it comes to quantifying energy in terms of megajoules uh, or in terms of kilowatt hours. But when it comes to the importance of the individual, it is an absolutely essential need for the village. Uh, also with that is that while the, uh, the upper three there, the, the wood require no cost to the user for fuel, those latter three are of substantial cost to the user. And so the dollars per mega, megajoule or the dollars per kilowatt hour are very high for those expenditures. And so now uh, I'm going to talk a bit more about the, uh, the, the heat aspects, and then I'll go into power a bit more later on. And my viewpoint is that the sustainable village solution, it must address all of these areas. We, if we're going to spend the time to develop a relationship, make a five-year commitment, uh, and do that work, Let's look at how do we progress? How do we provide multiple needs to the village? To get a bit more specific, what's interesting is that uh, 3 quarters of energy in the village is used on wood cook stoves. And on those cook stoves, about one half of women own more than one cook stove. And so there's not one device. There's no uh, one stove top. There's, you know, there's a toaster. There's a microwave. Now, I'm giving you uh, metaphors that we understand, but I'm, well, what you would experience there is multiple different types of wood cook stoves. And in these, these 13 distinct ownership groups. And so I have to show you a little bit here, uh, which is uh, a first interesting observation is that many people think cook stoves are only used for cooking meals. But uh, much broader than that is heating water, making medicine, roasting peanuts, um, boiling shea uh, uh, into, and then rendering it into oil, which goes into a lot of the um, uh, personal care soaps and lotions that we use uh, in uh, developed countries. And cooking meals of the stoves out there they're used for a variety. Those cooking stoves are used for a variety of meal types. Now, once you get to non-meal types, really the three stone fire, which is that far left with all those X's, that's really what you can use. And you can realize that by looking at the max, max ingredients in the cooking vessel at 45 kilograms. And that was an observation that I made. Now I'm saying that that's the weight capacity of three stones, uh, the mass capacity of three stones. Now, uh, with those other stoves, since they can only uh, uh, use smaller meals or smaller masses, they're not going to be used for heating water for family, et cetera. Now, what's interesting then from that last slide is that no single stove is likely to satisfy all energy needs. It's not going to be versatile enough to meet all their needs. And we see that every day in our own lives. And so why should we expect that for someone else in the world? And so now. Once I get to, now that we think we're going to need multiple types of solutions, what also, let's give some definition of what those solutions need to do. So what factors explain cooking energy use? 
and I want to be very uh, specific in uh, what I'm saying here is this is different than the question asked in comparing cooking stoves, which is which cook stove uses less fuel. That's one consideration, but I'm taking a broader question is what defines uh, cooking energy use? So is it uh, how the fire is ignited, what's being cooked, type of cook stove, the operator, etc. And as a, a daily uh, summary, uh, to summarize on a daily basis uh, for these studies, to look at uh, energy use for one family, you see uh, the energy of a day uh, of a day equals the meal, water, what's used for peanuts, medicine, tea, and I grayed out the shia there on the right because it's only uh, shia is only made during part of the year, and so I don't include that in the daily energy use estimation. Uh, but I conducted. Uh, single regression and multiple regression analysis to come up with some estimators or some statistical equations that you see in front of you right now. And I'll get on to multiple regression in a minute, but let me just talk about single regression to have you that one variable that you see right there. So in cooking meals, you see that there's um, 53.51, and that's uh, megajoules uh, per family per day, plus 3.90, and then you multiply it times the number of people in the family. M total is the mass of total ingredients being cooked. The M dry is the mass of dry ingredients being cooked. Uh, heating water, NP is the same number of people, uh, mass of water. And then as you go down, uh, you have the mass of peanuts, rate of peanuts, uh, rate of making medicine, and, and then uh, the rate of making tea. And you have these equations right there. And these equations, one of the ways that you can use these is to say, OK, now that I have a village, I have this information. Now, I don't want to do this detailed study that Nate did over these four visits and uh, go uh, back to Africa for a month at a time. What I want to do is connect, uh, create a demographic survey, or I want to just measure how much, uh, how much uh, mass of the ingredients being cooked. So then you go do that, and then you apply these equations to estimate the energy use for your individual village. And so that gives you a very quick way to estimate, to now estimate uh, energy use for many villages. And so you do this, and I can just leave this up there briefly, but this is a flow chart that you can follow and you can go back to later for going from the upper left to the lower right and what equation you would use in what, cir in what circumstance. And so that gives you that flow chart right now. So you can do that if you're conducting your own study. And as you see in that two, on the slide title, that's referencing a journal article uh, that's forthcoming, and you can access that to get a bit more details. So using this information, I can say, OK, let's take the uh, village average of 12.8 people, and let's round up to 13 people. What will be their uh, wood energy use profile on their cook stove? So this is it. Throughout the entire year, this is what it would look like from cooking meals, uh, space heating, not on cook stoves. The, um, I have that information elsewhere. You have heating water, processing shea, roasting peanuts. All of that is displayed, displayed in the single diagram. And you can see easily how that also varies by season, noting the cold and dry seasons on the far right. There's quite a bit for space heating. And then how many uh, kilograms of wood is used on the right side. And so for a family of 13, they use about five, uh, five tons of wood uh, per year for their uh, cooking and heating needs. Now that we've talked about what a family uses, let's also look a, a bit more on what factors define uh, meal energy use. And what, how I ended up doing that was doing a multiple regression analysis. I analyzed 16 factors, and of those 16 factors, I identified six that were uh, statistically significant as far as uh, uh, explaining energy use. One was the family size, another dry mass, total mass, which I mentioned. Another one is the number of cooking fires. And so instead of using one fire, if you use two fires, the amount of energy used for that session actually increases. The type of cooking activity, if you're making a sauce, you use more energy than if you're just making a grain. And then the use of embers, which is a very uh, intriguing observation, is that it reduces energy use by about 10% for the cooking session. And that's just on the ignition phase. And uh, what is also surprising is that cook stoves had very little impact after accounting for all of these other factors. And if you go do a cook stove, and you can realize this, if you go out and do a cook stove comparison test, is that you largely need uh, large data sets to make statistically uh, significant uh, comparisons to make, to make those. 
Now, after you include all of these other factors that could be confound, confounding that under, understanding, you find that the impact of cook stoves drop out. At least some of them do. Some of them in the village were found to reduce energy use by 25%, but not statistically significantly. Others increase uh, wood use by 20%, and that was significant. And so it's this uh, interesting, maybe we're not answering the whole problem, which was the point of doing the study. And then as you see there, uh, some of the words got crunched in the file conversion process, but there's grain type, grain size, and a whole lot of other factors that are not actually significant to uh, energy use. And so now that we know what factors are significant, how do we use those to design options or influence options to reduce cooking energy use? And if I'm looking at improved cook stoves, let's take four options. The, uh, those four are pretty, uh, pretty standard, um, well, I guess well out there in terms of uh, eight initiatives. Solar water heaters, and you see that 27.4% is because the solar water heater would displace 100% of the wood used to heat water, and 27.4% of the wood used on cook stoves goes to heating water. So you see how that comes together. Communal cooking groups, going from a village average of 12.8 people uh, per fire up to uh, larger cooking fires, and then using uh, burning embers to actually uh, ignite the fire. And so that would be a reduction in 10% uh, in wood use. And so there's these options. And what's interesting is it's not just an artisan improved stove. It's not just solar water heaters. There's much more to this picture that we can consider. And to show you what that looks like is this. So how do we combine these options? We're not just doing one. We're looking at different sets of options. Cook stove is one, as you see in that upper line right there. It would save you uh, 40 percent. And if it saved you 40 percent, it would cost you $350 uh, on an annual basis. And that EAC is called the equivalent annual cost. It basically allows you to compare the cost of two uh, items um, uh, on a similar time basis. And so it, it takes into account discount factors and the lifetime of the object so you can make a more apples to apples comparison. But as we see, and as we go through here, on the communal cooking, you start to have some very large savings after you combine all these options. Now, if I show those on a diagram, combining all of the stoves and all of the different options, you actually have 60. You don't just have one. You have 60 options you can look at. And as we get into the upper left aspect of the diagram, the options save more, but yes, also they're more expensive. And so you might look about concentrating into that upper middle area of the graph a next gener generation single pot cook stove and a solar water heater. And uh, the, the five dots that you see in vertical there are the, uh, the types of interventions that don't include uh, a cost, such as embers and communal cooking uh, right there. And so you can take a look at this. And now an engineer can work with the community or the aid agency and say, OK, here's our options. Now where do we go from here? Another thing to consider is incomplete adoption and replacement. And so you have all of your uh, applications for one cook stove uh, at, let's say, it's say 50% of your energy. Now, going down uh, next, you see if it's just cooking meals, you don't save as much as you would expect. Going down even further to the next gray, uh, I guess, fan that's going out there is just heating water. And that's at 100% replacement. Now, let's assume that. OK, it's used for cooking meals. That's only a portion of what it could be used for. And when it's used for cooking meals, it's only 60% of the time. And it even de decreases the potential impact further. And you get to that actually down to that red X there. As we see often, the, often that 50% of the stoves that are implemented are actually used, are actually adopted. And if they're not used for everything and they're only used part of the time, that 50% savings you would expect is actually probably closer to 10. And that depends on the community, but that's not uh, that much of a leap in understanding. And so this is a big difference. You need to understand that during the design. And those gray bounds right there is just uh, an air bounds bracket of 20%. So these are the journal articles that if you want to go back, you can take a look. Um, one's accepted with minor revisions. There's two forthcoming. Uh, one this week and actually one next week will be submitted. If you'd like copy, copies of those uh, or want to talk about them, please feel free to use the, uh, the contact information at the end of the slides to give me, a, give me a ring. So now that I've talked about these, just to give you a little summary, is that 
energy supply and use is driven by human, natural, and engineered systems. And every form of energy, no matter how small, is vital. That's heat and power, which is great because that transitions us into talking about uh, electricity. We're going to talk about power using the optimization uh, software Homer. And Homer grew out of uh, NREL, National Renewable Energy Laboratory in the United States, uh, started in 1992. And uh, since then, it's been spun off into uh, a for-profit venture. And I'd like to tell you a bit more about how Homer is used to analyze electrical uh, systems for rural villages. We've talked about village energy. We've talked about how do we compare systems for heat applications. Now let's get a bit more specific into power. And what's excellent is this is a very interactive tool that we can use to compare uh, what is called microgrids. And the microgrid is largely a uh, distributed uh, generation composed of wind power, uh, solar power. It, it could still be getting power from some type of grid connection. There may be storage batteries. But it's not just getting a single line going into your house. And you wouldn't expect that, perhaps, for a village. Solar PV isn't on for all hours of the day. So you need a battery backup. Those are some of the concepts that form the initial understanding for the microgrid. Where Homer, uh, I guess, has its uh, forte or its uh, best performance as far as the, the overall landscape of uh, power systems is in the 10 kilowatt to 10 megawatt range. Uh, there is about two thirds of the, the clients or the users of the 70,000 users are in developing countries or have problems in developing countries. And then a third are in uh, developed countries doing projects, uh, especially in Hawaii and Alaska where the cost of electricity is still quite high and you get isolated or island in situations. Now the big question that Homer seeks to answer is what kind of system is going to be the best and under what conditions? And the graphical results, so the village energy diagram, what's the one diagram that I can show you to illustrate that? That would be the optimal system type graph. And that'll tell us the optimal system design. And what you see here is there's not, you point to, a, uh, this graph doesn't show you one solution. This is actually a, a continuous space of all possible solutions. And it shows you under each scenario which one is going to be the best. And so if I can maybe, do a little bit of drawing here. You see here over on the left, this is the wind speed in meters per second. And it goes from a low here of 4.5 up to a high here of 8.5. And so we're doing a sensitivity analysis. We're trying to figure out how robust the system is to changes in the environment. So maybe you don't have all the information, like we've mentioned consistently throughout this presentation. Well, OK, let's see how, what effect that information or what effect that variable change has on the quality of our system. Maybe one is more economical than the other, and it's more robust. Maybe it's not technically feasible anymore. Another interesting part about what we can do on this graph is that this is your AC load that I put there on the x-axis. And that shows us how many kilowatt hours are used per day. It goes from a low here of 15 up to a high of uh, 67 and a half. And what this illustrates is load growth. Let's say we start over here uh, with 20, 20 kilowatt hours per day. What we find is that yellow, if you go to this upper right side, is that the PV and battery, hey, it's going to be perfect no matter what speed you're at. But now, what happens if, we start to, if the village starts to use more energy? Now that you have power, people want to use more of it. Sure, that's reasonable. That's understandable. Let's check here, and let's go up to uh, 40. So for 40 kilowatt hours per day, and we're looking right here. Oh, look, uh, once we get that high, we can no longer use PV and battery. We need to add a generator. So you see the de degen right there. And even further up here, as the wind speed gets further up, you would expect that as wind speed increase, the amount of power that you could get out of your windmill up to a certain point, uh, your wind turbine would increase. And therefore, you have wind, PV, and battery with no generator at all. And so it gives you a realistic and a technical and economic decision analysis tool. And so that's just an illustration of how you would use uh, this graph here. So continuing a bit on, how do you create this type of uh, end analysis to make these decisions is Homer takes in uh, three types of information. One is energy sources. So that is the cost of diesel, 
uh, your solar uh, radiation. You just give it latitude and longitude, and it finds it. Uh, there's a graphical information system. Uh, clicking on Google Maps is coming out in the next version. Uh, wind resource, hydro resource. Loads in the middle there, those are just uses of energy, whether they be electrical or thermal. Uh, power system components. If you need the generator, a battery, PV, converter to go from AC to DC, uh, power and back, uh, hydro, uh, wind, all of those can be added. And so the user specifies these, adds them in. What Homer does is it takes these many different options. It takes these thousands of types of equipment or thousand permutations and says, OK, Let's do an energy balance. Let's make the simulation. Let's optimize on the simulation. And then let's run some sens sensitivity analysis to figure out which, uh, how robust that solution is. And what you get out, the, get out at the end of the day is, yes, the results for every single simulation you made, but also it shows you what is the optimal system for each power system configuration. And on the left, you have a generator and converter. So maybe you have an AC generator and you have an AC load and a DC load, so you need a converter to get to there. Maybe you need a generator, a battery, and a converter. Or maybe even the most cost-effective option is a PV generator, battery, and converter. And it will provide you the optimal system for each one of those configurations. So what size of the generator should be? How many converters do I need? What size is the PV going to panel need to be? Where do I need to place it? Um, uh, what orientation does it need to be? What are the effects on temperature, et cetera? What loads are going to be used on the generator? What times a day? And to show you an example of analysis of this, this here is a village load. It's a bit more, um, uh, this energy use is, uh, is more than what uh, the, the dissertation analysis I did, but I wanted to give you uh, an illustration. Is you have a, a telecom load, so the increasing uh, prevalence of cell phones. You have a small AC distribution system, and then you also have uh, deferable battery charging for people to charge their batteries and take them with them, or do cell phone charging, et cetera. And this is what it looked like. You have a generator on the AC bus right there. You see right there, here's the AC bus, and then you have your DC bus. Your converter links between them. You have some AC loads, DC loads, battery, and PV are on the DC side. So kind of continuing through here, what the loads look like, and these are just what the power uh, is throughout the day. Telecom, kind of low, and then it peaks when people start to use their phones. Village load, pretty flat throughout the day, but then in the evening, people start to use it for things, similar to what we would see uh, many places in the world. And then battery charging can be done whenever there's excess electricity. So we call that a deferable load. It's used whenever there's excess renewable power. So if we compare these energy needs, on the, on the top, you have one load. And then the second option is there you have two loads. And the last, you have three loads. And what's interesting is that all of these require a generator. Now, the, another interesting part about this is if you go from the telecom down to the lower left and you just simply add battery charging, you increase cost by 1,000. <clears throat> That's the net present cost. Now, if you go to the right, you want that telecom and you add those village AC loads, your cost goes up by quite a bit much more. Now, let's say, you know what, we have the, the telecom and the village loads, and now we want to just add the uh, deferable storage for people to charge the batteries uh, when they want to. That's not that much cost increase. And so that deferable, being able to defer power to when renewable energy is available is huge, and that's an extreme cost saving. And you could even save more energy from this uh, um, by going to a bit more detailed thing I'll show you on this next slide. And so these are the four scenarios right here that I showed on that last slide is this right here is all three loads. So just draw on a three right there. These two in the middle are two loads. And this one right there is one load. And if you look at this, the, the generator hours in the year, so 8,760 hours in a year that the generator is used, the generator isn't used for very much. So if we were to allow some capacity shortage, if we didn't require uninterruptible power, we said that, you know what, it's OK if 1% uh, of the year, the community said it's OK if 1% of the year power isn't used, or maybe 2% of the year we don't have power. Well, that's going to illustrate some significant cost savings. And what you can do is uh, look, for instance, if all three loads here at the bottom, and you see that 
uh, while as we uh, go up, the net present cost gets much higher. And I guess what I should say is on the last slide I was talking about the initial capital. And if we want to drill down and get a bit more specific, there are some detailed time series results. And I'll just um, shortly discuss these. What you see on the bottom one, which may be uh, the top, I guess, in the bottom one, is now in this point right here, our uh, battery state of charge and our deferrable storage is getting very low. And so that means, oh no, our batteries are running out or uh, the amount of energy available to charge batteries that people bring in is low. And so we need to turn on the generator. And so that's what happens there. If you are allowed to say, okay, you know what, let's wait until the middle of the day when we have solar power, which you actually see right here, then you would be fine. So if you were, for instance, to say, OK, in this part of the day, we're not going to have any battery charging, and we're just going to take that out, oh, I'm going to be fine, because later on, I'm going to get solar power. So you can make those types of planning decisions and say, yes, I need a generator, or don't. You can make dispatch decisions and go forward. And so that's an example of the detailed results. Some additional functionality that you can look at in the home that we didn't cover today is uh, operating reserves. Sure, what's also more interesting is intermittent grid. And so looking at uh, what is the likelihood for a grid to, uh, to, to fail, and how do you actually prioritize your loads based on that. So now you have unmet load, which loads did you turn off. Looking at multiple generators and dispatch strategies. So when do you charge the batteries, uh, when not to charge the batteries. Uh, thermal production and thermal loads, and then emissions penalties. So to doing a bit more of the CDM type scale analysis. So you can do that. And you can do all this by going uh, on the website, and you can try Home Route for free. So feel free to go there. And if you have any questions at all, either on the dissertation research or the, the work that I'm currently doing at Homer, I'm working on developing and uh, helping Homer expand into energy management decision analysis and looking uh, more on that scale. So it's uh, bringing this robust tool and applying it to uh, different types of markets. So if you're interested in any of this stuff, I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you so much, Nathan. And uh, we really appreciate this incredibly thorough walk through your research. Um, at this time, I would like to invite our participants to post their questions in the chat window. I know we had some comments come in. Um, but uh, I want to make sure that we do, of course, address all your questions we have until noon to uh, get through them all. So let's uh, let's move forward with that. And Nathan, I've captured some uh, requests for uh, your papers, uh, and we will forward you that information. Perfect. Um, thank you. All right. So it looks like there is some uh, questions coming in. Uh, one question is, is it easier for a village to adopt a single and new technology or the wide variety you advocate? I would say uh, it depends on the village, but I would say even that's a good question. And as a prelude to answer that question, I would say it depends on what the village asks for. Uh, it's obvious that cook stoves are important in most areas of the world, but both, most people don't think cook stoves are important. So you uh, start with lighting which or electricity, which is a high need. It's a high priority. And that works to help, uh, well, one, provide the client with what they're looking for, uh, and then also, two, build trust. And so I would start with one and work from there. All right, thank you. Another question has come in. What is the connecting technology for the microgrid? Well, the, I guess the, the microgrid is a, is a concept. Uh, and so the connecting technology, I guess maybe if I could, um, in interpreting your question, is, uh, well, one, for sure, if you have an AC load that's, um, I guess, centralized, you'd have uh, a grid-connected solution with wires. Now, if you're talking about uh, the controllers and things that we, you would use to manage the dispatch decisions or when the generator is turned on and off, those would be separate electrical devices that would be installed near to that uh, near to that device in a village. Now, if we were looking at microgrids, for instance, in or microgrid scenarios in developed countries, what you would have is perhaps the uh, the central utility could, for instance, um, uh, control uh, whether your uh, solar panels on the top of your roof provide power to the grid, or if you have battery storage, whether that battery storage provides battery back to the grid in areas for uh, frequency control, for instance. And so if I'm talking about the connecting technology, um, there's microgrid the concept, uh, 
um, but as far as the uh, logistics locally in a village, what's what's useful is also the the uh, policy and regulatory hurdles and security issues that are really constraining the work in developed countries don't exist in uh, villages, and uh, as such, uh, you can make much more. Uh, simple systems, low cost, and extremely impactful. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you. Wait, wait. We do you have one more question? And that question is, did you research any of the supply chain restrictions, such as important importation of panels or batteries or other elements of a microgrid when looking at cost structure? It's a good question, and my dissertation analysis focused solely on the village, and so taking an engineering standpoint, I uh, drew a, uh, I guess, a system boundary around the village and looked at what came in and out and what uh, policies or, or the, um, uh, uh, what is it, all the technical factors that were associated with that, and. Um, so to, I guess to answer that question, what's what's interesting is no on the uh, on the for instance the tariff structures that would influence, but what also is interesting is that when people go collect wood in the forest, what most models and what post most papers assume is that they do so in a concentric ring that grows around the village, and so basically you know they take off a couple meters of the forest every year marching out towards the forest. I didn't find that to exist at all, and most of the villages that I have found that's never been the case. And so a lot of the work that's being done, a lot of the models that are used to say, here's how an intervention is going to impact the forest or impact the environment, have a fundamental mistake in the, uh, in the quality of analysis that they can do. They're making an assumption, and without data, you have to make an assumption, and that's very understandable, but realizing that the quality of models, models are based on our data and our assumptions. And what I found is a much more distributed and uh, decentralized form of collection, where it did not appear to degrade the forest in any memorable future of the villagers. Thank you, Nathan. I know there's some folks still typing, so I'm going to give them a minute to finish up their, their typing. Um, I do have sure. one comment uh, that came in, uh, which is that this is an interesting technical evaluation. However, sociocultural factors are just as important, often more. Uh, those need to be taken into account as well. Uh, the other related aspect is economical sustainability. Um, as we know, that no technology will ever be suitable if as soon as the dollar moves out, it cannot continue, continue for lack of funds. So um, I don't know if you wanted to speak to any of that, um, Nathan, or you know maybe share your thoughts. Yeah, no, it's actually a good question, and I, uh, there's only so much you can cover in a presentation. But one of the excellent examples, as you mentioned, uh, um, one is uh, the financing, and what most people do, and that's a huge problem. And uh, what's what's common in the works, the groups that I've worked in, is that for that uh, I guess work is called drive-by development, where you have a funder come through, you have a group come through, they drop off the technology, and they leave and never come back again. That's one of the reasons why 90% of cook stove projects fail and 30% of uh, water projects fail prematurely. And what we've done in the village, and the villages that I worked in, is the electrical solution to provide, uh, to provide uh, charged uh, batteries that go for electrical use in the home for lighting and personal electronics. Those are rented. And so there's uh, some funding that was obtained to provide the initial cost of those batteries so that people don't need to pay $100 for a lead acid battery. So what they do is they rent those batteries for uh, $2 a month, and then they charge those batteries for $0.50 cents per charge, which lasts anywhere between one to two weeks, depending on the usage characteristics. And that financing scheme works with, uh, it's worked with everyone in the village that is, uh, is looking to, uh, I guess, keep it up. And we're actually having trouble making, uh, keeping up with demand uh, because people are so uh, looking for, even at those price points, and even you know, only spending $100 per family per year on energy that they're totally devoted in doing it. And it looks to save uh, substantially also from kerosene. And so that's on the, uh, the economic side. And you're totally right about the social side. And um, you, the contextual factors through the, through the participant observations uh, initially in my study, I can send those out to you if you want, if you want those uh, through the paper. And you cannot overlook those. And that's why you really need to figure out, you really just need, those don't need to just uh, be there and measure stuff. You need to be in the home. Uh, working with families, testing stuff, going back, revisiting, et cetera. And that's, that cannot be overlooked. 
We couldn't agree with you more, Nathan. On the ground presence is incredibly critical, and especially having those close relationships with communities is indispensable. So um, I do have one question that came in, and this is absolutely the last one, so I apologize for everyone if anybody has further questions. Apart from lack of data on energy in the area you visited, do you, do you find or get help from communities in support of your research? Mm, uh, another good question. It's a, uh, it's a combination. I've, throughout my experience in uh, doing this work, uh, I've had, um, the, I guess the understanding that goes into this analysis has been more of a six-year process. And so some of it has been uh, uh, non-profit, some of it's been uh, for-profits and actually multi, multi-billion dollar uh, uh, companies. Uh, some of it has been uh, the U.S. government uh, or uh, international aid agencies. And so I've been able to piece together these experiences uh, that were then used uh, for my dissertation research. And so there, there is, fortunately, now more opportunities growing since people are understanding the importance of local analysis. And uh, hopefully there will be some more opportunities for uh, uh, people in the future. Thank you so much, Nathan. So this brings us to the end of our webinar. I'd like to thank everybody for joining us. And I would also like to thank Nathan. Um, as you see, his contact information is available here. If you have further questions that we didn't address today, we encourage you to contact him with your inquiries. And of course, we'll be sharing more information on our upcoming webinars on the website listed here, as well as by email to all of you. Thank you again. I hope everybody has a great uh, day, evening, morning, wherever you may be. And we look forward to having you on our next webinar. Take care, everyone.